Hello. Hi. I'm Lori, Lori Lucas. I live in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I lived for many years in Brussels, Belgium, where I spoke French, not Flemish, and where I taught uh, in English. Last night at a bar, uh, the bar of a restaurant where my friend and I were eating, I uh, told a gentleman that I was going to be giving a presentation on Yiddish, and he said, who would go? <laughs> 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 uh, and, and, and he actually turned out to be a Jewish guy from New York who was bringing his daughter to McGill for the first time, and I said, I don't know, we'll see. So, yeah, thank you for coming. Uh, I don't speak Yiddish, so this is not, I'm not here to speak in Yiddish or to teach you Yiddish, um, but my presentation is that Yiddish is a living language, that it's not, come on in, it's not a dead language, it's not a dying language, uh, it's not one that needs to be revived. So uh, one of the things that, uh, so that is the thrust of this presentation uh, and what I will be uh, arguing. Hi. I don't know, everything fine? Thumbs up. Okay. What's your name? Sabrina. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have spoken via cyberspace. Um, yeah, no, I started because I got a lot to say. When, um, when I was a kid, uh, growing up in Chicago, I had uh, three grandparents. I had two grandpas, I had a grandma. I had a little grandpa, he lived in Chicago where I lived. I had a big grandpa, he lived in Washington, D.C. with my grandma, who I think spoke only Yiddish. All of my grandparents came from the old country. So Poland, Russia, uh, Germany, and they all spoke um, Yiddish. So my uh, big grandpa, when he would come, come on in, from Washington, D.C., <coughs> he would somehow find the Yiddish newspaper. I never knew where he got it, how he found it, he would just walk out of the house, and we were way up on the north side of Chicago, and he would find, he was so annoying, and he would find and come back with uh, the four verts, which means forward, and he would uh, have his newspaper in Yiddish. Little Grandpa, who lived in Chicago, where I live, uh, we often went to his house, his apartment, and he was a storyteller. So he would tell uh, long stories. I think that's really the only kind that you tell in Yiddish. Uh, long stories. And he would generally sometimes tell them in English, but uh, when he did, the punchline was always in Yiddish. <laughs> and so we kids would be hanging around. And these were not jokes for kids. These were off-color uh, stories. So when he got to the, the, uh, to the punchline, he would say something like, Rebbe, die Dienst trumped. And we kids would just look at each other. By the way, it means the maid is pregnant. But I remember that so well, uh, hearing the Yiddish uh, as a child. So, new, what is it? Let's see if this works. 
Yeah. Yay. Okay. So, hi, come on in. Nu means so, what. Does anybody here know Yiddish? A couple of people. Okay, so you can help me out. But I guess we're not going to do question and answer during um, the presentation. But um, I'm trying to leave time at the end so I don't go over. Um, Yiddish is the historical language of the Ashkenazim. So the Ashkenazi Jews in Germany, Poland, and Russia. Yiddish forms a branch of the Indo-European language family. As I said, the language of the Ashkenazi, yeah, it's up there. I'm going to write it on the board. Um, the Mama Lushen. Mama Lushen means mother tongue. Um, so, so far you've heard three Yiddish words, Nu and Mama Lushen. Um, so that is the people from Central and Eastern Europe and their descendants. My grandparents, my uh, parents, me, my children, and um, Kinderlach. There's another Yiddish word for you. A um, couple of my kids, actually one of them, did 23 and me recently. And they were all excited. They said, ooh, uh, maybe, I don't know what we're going to find out. Maybe our great-grandparents had slaves. I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> we're, we're, we're Ashkenazi Jews, and that's all it's going to say. And sure enough, that's what came back, 99.6% Ashkenazi Jew. So along with Hebrew and Aramaic, Yiddish is one of the three major literary languages of Jewish history, and it dates way back from 10th century. So it wasn't, it's not a new or even a relatively new language. The um, Jews who lived in France in northern Italy, hi, come on in, began to establish large communities in German. Now, you might be thinking, is that the same as Hebrew? No. So Yiddish and Hebrew are two different languages. Um, Hebrew, in its modern form, is spoken by many of the seven million people in Israel, whereas Yiddish, which literally means Jewish, is a high German language um, of Ashkenazi origins spoken throughout the world. I know I keep saying Ashkenazi, but that is really the origin of Yiddish. So how did it come about? It developed as a fusion of German dialects with Hebrew and Aramaic. Um, and they're not similar, uh, even though both Yiddish and Hebrew use Hebrew script. And in the Yiddish alphabet, it's called the Aleph Beis, which are the first two uh, letters of the Yiddish alphabet. Um, but as I said, in spite of the fact that both Yiddish and Hebrew use the uh, Hebrew alphabet, they are quite different, and Yiddish, come on in, is a unique language. It's not just a German dialect. It is a complete language. We can't get too far into talking about Yiddish without um, mentioning that on the eve of World War II, there were roughly 12 million Yiddish speakers in the world. The Holocaust destroyed most of this population. And the Holocaust, I can't remember if I got this up there, is in Europe and in Israel called the Shoah, which means destruction 
or calamity. Almost all of the approximate six million Jews who died in the Holocaust were Yiddish speakers. But the last century brought many positive developments for Yiddish. And that's what I'm doing here, is to tell you what those are. Um, in brief, Yiddish is now being seriously studied as an academic discipline at many universities all over the world. S University of Washington, University of Colorado, where I live in Boulder. Um, there are Yiddish study departments at Columbia and Oxford in England and here in Montreal. There are Yiddish study, there's a Yiddish study department here at McGill, for example. Um, another positive development is that Yiddish has been recognized as great world literature as evidenced by Isaac Bishevitz singers receiving the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1978 for his writings in Yiddish. And upon receiving the Nobel Prize, he said, Yiddish has not yet said its last word. Um, who speaks it now? You may be asking. About one and a half million Jews, mainly Jews, mainly in Europe, Israel, and North America. In addition to Yiddish being studied at various universities, there are also institutes, lecture series presented by the YIVO Institute, Yiddish theater, including the Yiddish version of Fiddler on the Roof, which is playing in New York City right now. And uh, really to much popular acclaim, I think it's just been extended. Um, and uh, Sweden, no. That's a bulletin. Um, Fiddler on the Roof was, is based on short stories about Tevya the Dairyman, um, written by Sholem Alechem, and that is the pen name of Solomon Naumovich Rabinovich. And he was a leading Yiddish author and playwright. And as I said, Fiddler is based on his stories about Tevya the Dairyman. Uh, on this subject of Yiddish culture, um, in addition to uh, the Fiddler on the Roof being played in Yiddish right now, there are Yiddish newspapers, which still exist, Yiddish typewriters, literature, and poetry, and you are probably familiar with klezmer music, um, which I don't have any for you to listen to today, but I have something else for you to listen to. Um, continuing my positive developments. Here's a bulletin because every day I find new positive developments related to Yiddish. Sweden, of all places, is the epicenter of Yiddish children's media. In 1990, no, Sweden? Did she, did she say Sweden? In 1999, Yiddish was declared an official national minority language, along with some others like Finnish. There is federal funding in Sweden for media produced in its any national minority language. So now Sweden, of all places, has become a major source of new Yiddish children's books, TV cartoons, uh, web media, and movie video. Uh, even though 
there is less than 0.2% uh, Jews living in Sweden. Um, however, the Jewish uh, community was established near Gothenburg in the 1770s, and that's why they were able to do that. So that is called Yid Kid Lit, uh, <laughs> Sweden. Who, who would have guessed? Um, more positive developments. Many Jewish communities are now offering classes so that people can learn Yiddish. So you can go to your local community center, you can learn French or English or uh, Spanish uh, and even Yiddish. Partly because many young people think it's cool, cool to learn Yiddish. And in a minute, I'm going to show you a couple of crazy Montrealers. Anybody <laughs> familiar with Yid Life Crisis? Okay. <laughs> you all will be in just a minute. And part of the reason I play it is uh, not only that uh, because these guys are funny, it's actually a YouTube show, uh, uh, but so that you can hear, I'm talking about Yiddish, but I'm not speaking y Yiddish, or fortunately, or you wouldn't understand it, but um, this way you'll be able to hear a couple of minutes of it. Another reason uh, that uh, Yiddish continues to be a force is that many Jews today want to regain touch with their heritage. They feel that they lost much of it. Many people, when I said that I was going to um, talk about the Yiddish language, uh, including the guy at the bar, <coughs> Mr. Schwartz, he said, my grandparents spoke it. And so for that reason, a lot of people want to regain touch with their heritage, with their grandparents. Um, getting back to Yiddish newspapers for a moment, they began to appear in the mid-1800s, uh, and some, like forwards, which means forward, uh, still exist, even though uh, it was started back in 1897. Now, how many people live here in Montreal? Good. Yiddish is alive in Montreal. Um, so let me see where am I? OK. Are you ready? I think this is going to work. Yeah, du kannst uh, gehen kacken tief in Jam, weil Fairmont ist die Vatican von Beglach und es ist eine Schappe und eine Schande, als du kannst es nicht sehen. Genug, mir reicht nur was, Pope's Laser. Ja, uh, ja, yeah, yeah, Imam Chaimi. Ja. Eins, zwei, drei, nach. Mann. Es ist besser. Es ist besser, wie ihr denkt. Viele Leute auf Mode sein, es ist auf der Geschichte zu schmieren, das Bagel, bis es rinnt in Philadelphia. Du darfst ein Mädel. Ich darf ein Messer. Nu, wir gehen zur Firma. Geht ihr mir weg, geht ihr zur Tamp? Ja. Sehr mit dem Platoische Sonntag, nein? Ja, ich habe lieb jeden von den drei schönen Tagen von dem Jahr. Woanders in der Welt kann man einen äh, separatisten Schwemmelhändler finden. Äh, er ist in der äh, Cohen Gödel. Und ein Fratboy, der dient zu Fisch, zu zanzen in äh, selben Tamtam Rengeläufen Mountain. Und der Schaß sei Ottoman, der Geschmack von Marihuana, was die Polizei sehr allein reichen nennt. Da war die Nigung von Französisch, Englisch, Italienisch, Portugiesisch, hat er reingemischt in ein Pyrlen Moyale. Sie? Als schon der heilige Seelung. 
Wo mir heute beide die Nummer 1 und 2 Bagel geschärft in den Welt, als sie zählt bei das dosige Block. Ja, und die Nummer 1 und 2 gegräste Gasloch in den Welt, als unter mein Fiss. <lacht> no, das ist wurde die Jonte von Traction. Ja, also die anderen 48 Wochen von dem Jahr sind nicht kein Jonte. Dank Gott, sie haben so viel Soft gehabt, die Gelegenheit. Ja, Dank Gott, sie haben Huch! Welche andere Stadt hat die Schiebebuch eben bei Putzfahren in Severischen Winter zusammen mit äh, Quebec was schicklich bei Putzfahren äh, Summer of Love? Ja. Hat der Ramon gewundert, was hat geworden sein? Sie, unsere Eltern haben nicht dezidiert zu äh, zermischen mit weltlicher Welt. Wir haben gewollt äh, sein sein, ne? Oi. Und äh, von was wollen wir reden? Du weißt, die, die nachrichten Kleinigkeiten von Tamurischen Gesetz, jeden Tag und jeden Nacht. Also, also die Arena äh, Kodesh darf sein 15 Uhr praten von dem Dorf und Wand von dem Bässe mit. Ja, aber, aber Rabbi Leise hat gesagt, Schöne, ja. ja. du schlafst mehr als 15 Uhr praten, dein Weib ist umrein ja. und auf Schlaf und eine andere Zeit. Aber Rabbi hat gegrüßt die Jusios von dem Gesetz, für, äh, zu sagen, äh, der Zach, 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 Ja, ja, du? Ja. Es ist sehr wichtig, dass man das ist richtig. Gerecht. Wir gehen hin und bestellen zwei Beiglach, die sollen ja. gewinnen, gebackt in der letzten Schule. Ja, du vergisst, als Brandstein hat erklärt, dass die Temperatur von diesen idyllischen Beigel essen hm. gehört von einem Verhalten ist ja. von Kerla zu Teig. Ja, aber es ist gewinnt bei Kent, als Fried hat gesagt, dass der richtige Ekel von Montreolischen Beigel essen ist basiert auf Verhalten nicht von dem Honig zum Wasser. Ja, das wurde aber doch ein Jobberdom, ich habe das Smokilo Eros geessen, die ersten Bosse, verstehst du? Ja, ich Hier! Hier! Mein Steg, alle Welt. Ja. Mein Heim, alle dort, wo ich hoch. Meine kindische Jorn, Abraham. Und wie bald sind wir mehr? Oi, 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 Welt. Okay. Give life crisis. So I discovered these guys, and by the way, um, I did get their permission. I was contacted them and told them what I was doing. Could I please, uh, oh, look, my family's up there. Could I please uh, get um, their permission? They said, oh, yeah, not a problem. So um, there you could hear a little bit. I know it's very funny. And uh, I actually had a hard time finding one that I could play to a group uh, because some of them are just a little bit raunchy and <laughs> some are a lot raunchy, but um, they are funny and they're very short YouTube shows and I think in the third season now uh, and, and the guys are very nice and very approachable. Um, so, back to my positive points. Somebody tell me the time so I get a feel here. Really? Oh, but we had till noon. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, so I thought maybe we had only till 11.45. <gasps> um, <laughs> but I'm from Chicago. I can talk fast. Um, Yiddish in Montreal. Yiddish was Montreal's third language for the first half of the 20th century. Up and down the main, people gossiped in Yiddish, they um, shopped in Yiddish, uh, they read the Canada Odler, uh, that was Montreal's daily Yiddish paper, the Canadian Eagle, no longer, and they flocked to Yiddish theater at the Monument National. For the tens of thousands of Jews who fled to Montreal from the pogroms and poverty of Russia, of Eastern Europe, Yiddish was the lingua franca that united a community with diverse geographical origins. That, of course, changed 
as new generations of Montrealers turn to English, but there are still many who speak Yiddish, largely due to the Hasidic community. So if you know anything about Yiddish, you have been waiting for me to say uh, the Hasidim, uh, because it is, that is another, uh, one of the biggest strongholds of the Yiddish language is the Hasidic, you saw them here, those two guys walking in front of them. Uh, I thought that was very funny because they were, um, I don't know who was imitating who, uh, <laughs> but uh, they were having a very deep philosophical discussion <laughs> about <laughs> which bagel place was better. Uh, and I'm sure that the other two guys were having, well, maybe, perhaps, a little uh, more serious one. Uh, so, uh, not only is Yiddish alive and well, but it has a future. So, on this page, I already showed you the Yid Life Crisis, and you can watch all the rest at your leisure. Um, but the future seems to be, aside from the Hasidim who speak Yiddish, secular, urban. I don't think that there are people in rural Alabama <laughs> speaking Yiddish. Maybe, but I doubt it. Um, bookish intellectuals um, and just people who want to be cool. Uh, that's part of the future. Uh, another thing that I think uh, signals Yiddish for the future is there's an artistic rena renaissance of Yiddish as something old and cool. Uh, for example, the New Yorker magazine recently published Yiddish Glory, the Lost Songs of World War II, and that kind of thing that uh, seems a bit uh, perhaps quirky or uh, idiosyncratic uh, or um, just kind of old coming back and uh, that people are finding interest in. Um, this is a great turnout, by the way. Thank you for coming. I thought uh, I would be speaking to my friend Tanya, it would just be <laughs> the two of us. And I was thinking, really, do we have to go from Boulder to Montreal for me to talk to you about Yiddish? So I'm glad that there are a few more of you. And a very diverse crowd, too. I'm, it's one thing that I'm very impressed with during my visit here in Montreal. Um, Jewish festivals are becoming uh, also very uh, important and quite common. Uh, Toronto um, has a Ashkenazi festival uh, every summer, uh, and it features uh, Yiddish and also klezmer music. So I couldn't get permission to play klezmer music, but uh, it's something I would recommend that you have a listen to. Um, in New York, the National Yiddish Theater, as I said, has extended its very popular Yiddish version of Fiddler on the Roof. And there are other uh, plays uh, that are being uh, performed again in Yiddish. Here in Canada, uh, at Montreal has a fairly active Yiddish art scene in the Dora Wasserman Yiddish Theater, and uh, again, the birthplace of Yid Life Crisis, cute name, uh, that web series about the two kvetching guys, uh, which is in its third, there's another Yiddish word for you, but I'm getting to Yiddish words. We're gonna spend the rest looking at Yinglish. Um, but everybody knows kvetch, right? Yeah. So don't kvetch. I'm almost done. Um, there is a Yiddish... Oops. Danke. Um, 
there is a Yiddish book center in Amherst, Mass. And you aren't going to believe this, but not Mr. Schwartz from the bar, but a lady I was sitting next to at the gate on uh, Thursday at the Denver airport was also bringing her daughter here to McGill. And um, when I told her what I was coming here for, she said, do you know about the Amherst Book Center, Yiddish Book Center? And I said, no, I know there is one, but I don't really know the story. And she told me the story. She might have made it up, but it's a great story. <laughs> she said, <laughs> there was this guy. I don't know what the guy's name. You can Google it. You Google, Google anything I'm saying. Um, you know, I'm probably telling lies, too. But um, there was this guy, and he was walking down the street in New York. She didn't say Brooklyn, but it was probably Brooklyn. And uh, he found, came upon these books in Yiddish. Uh, so he took them home, and he went back the next day, and there were more. And it turned out that that gentleman was divesting himself, his house, of his library. So he was putting out a few books at a time. Well, that led to other people who had Yiddish books that they want. They didn't know what to do with them. We all have books, you know, particularly textbooks and maybe esoterica, not erotica, esoterica, <laughs> that we don't know what to do with, you know. Uh, the bookstore doesn't want them. I mean, even the charity shops don't want them. You put them outside and you hope somebody gets them before it rains or here in Montreal it snows. So, what he did with all these books is he created a book center in Amherst, Mass. And so I said to this woman, Amherst, Mass, that seems like a goyish a place for uh, to Yiddish books to go. She said, yes, but next to it, and I don't know, maybe you do, is some suburb that is mainly Jewish. And I'm not familiar. It's one part of the world I've been to but have never lived in. So um, there exists a Yiddish book center in Amherst, Mass. There are all sorts of online tools um, that can help you learn Yiddish. Uh, there's something called Yiddish Pop, Pop for kids. Duolingo and a lot others that I don't know that now have um, Yiddish. And again, Yiddish is thriving in uh, New York City, definitely uh, kept alive by the Hasidic community. So my point is that the world of Yiddish, like everything else, is adapting and uh, being adapted and being adopted, which um, brings me to Yinglish or Yiddishisms. So we all know Yiddish words. I say abyssal Yiddish, which means a little, but I got more than a little here. I have this list of 20 and this list of 20. So I will get Okay, let me, you can take your pictures and let me get back to this list. And then, now what time is it? Assistant. 15 minutes, perfect. So we'll spend 10 minutes looking at these Yiddish words, five minutes for questions. I'm sorry, I'm a Virgo, I'm kind of organized. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> um, okay. That's, that's another topic. I have somewhere here. Oh, maybe I do. I need to find something. OK, so these are words that are in Yiddish, but which have been um, adopted uh, by uh, in other languages. I mean, definitely in English. Definitely if you live in New York, possibly in Montreal, I don't know. You have heard uh, these words before. 
so Bissell is a little bit. Uh, do you want something to eat? Uh, eh, a Bissell. Um, the second one, Bubby, that's me. I'm a Bubby. I'm a grandmother. Um, when I was a baby, I was schmaltzy. Schmaltz means fat. I, I guess I was fat. I remember being fat. But um, my dad called me schmaltzy. And now I'm a uh, bubby. And um, there's a great word, bubamites. And a bubamites is an old wives' tale. My mother, for example, used to say the Bible is a bubamites. It's just made up stories. No offense. Um, I, I, we're just sticking here to anecdotes. Um, bupkis, bupkis means nothing, but it almost means less than nothing. You know, just a small amount. After all that, all I got was bupkis. So, nothing. Uh, there are just words in not just Yiddish, but in every language that just really capsulate an idea, right? Okay, yeah, do tell me when that happens again. Um, you probably know the word chutzpah. So chutzpah is having nerve or balls. You're nodding, so I'm going to say that. Um, <laughs> and the famous story uh, about chutzpah is about the kid who kills his parents and then throws himself on the mercy of the court because he's an orphan. That's chutzpah. <laughs> uh, that next one is glitch. Uh, and that where you probably didn't even realize came from Yiddish, uh, but it does. It's a slip, um, a, a minor problem, a mistake. So there was a glitch in the works. Uh, let's see, what do we have? Emmis. Oh, I skipped Emmis. Um, uh, Emmis means the truth. So you tell somebody something, they say Emmis, you go Emmis. Yeah, it's the truth. Um, Ganeth. I don't have the word ganeth on there, but it's a great word. And there's so many ganeths around right now, particularly leaders of the world. It means a thief, a ganeth. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's a good one. And I have a different list than you. Gornish, nothing. Um, but it's a little more polite than bukkis. Uh, so it's just a strong sense of nothing, OK? What, what happened when you were there? Gornish, so nothing. A little more neutral than buckets. They're great words, though, you got to admit. Um, the next one, boy, that's a non-Jewish person, a Gentile. Um, uh, one Gentile person is a goy. Many are goyim. Um, and the goyish is uh, the adjective. I, I mean, we're not going to conjugate it, but there's many. <laughs> <laughs> many forms of it. Uh, to kibitz is talking, joking. What are they doing over there? They're kibitzing. They're schmoozing. Um, talking, joking. A klutz, uh, you all know. So that's, you know, somebody who is a very a clumsy person. Literally, it means a block of wood. Um, and so it's often used for a clumsy or awkward person. Uh, something that is uh, kosher means uh, that it's acceptable. And so you know that there are, uh, there's kosher foods and many Orthodox Jews keep kosher. But um, I, I use it all the time. You say, oh, here, here, I found a, a website for you. Is it kosher? Is it legit? Um, so it's used in that way, too. Uh, if something sounds a bit shady or suspicious, you might say, that doesn't sound kosher. Uh, there's the word kvetch, uh, number 12. We're never going to make it through this list, no matter how fast <laughs> I talk. Uh, and that's what those guys were doing. They're, they kvetch and they complain. 
um, you know, it's a, a kind of a whining, whinging, complaining. A maven is an expert, but that word is interesting because it's often used sarcastically. So I could say to somebody, oh yeah, I gave a presentation on Yiddish. Ah, so now you're a maven? So it's often used that way too, you know, uh, 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 sarcastically. Um, uh, uh, expert, yes. Um, yes. Mazel tov, you all should know, that's congratulations. Um, good luck. Um, it also can be sarcastic. I guess we're a sarcastic people. I never really <laughs> <laughs> realized that before. I thought it was just my family. But um, it, it can also be a sarcastic, uh, like you finish college and then you go back and live with your parents. Five years later, you're moving out. You go, mazel tov. Uh, 14 is, um, no, it's 15, a mensch. Mensch is an interesting word. And uh, by the way, I want to say something about the spelling here. Because this comes from Hebrew, everything's transliterated. I don't know if you notice, but in December, you might see Hanukkah spelled 14 different ways, <laughs> like with the CH, with H, with Ks and Cs. And uh, it, it, I, I don't think there's any one way. Uh, I just spell however I feel at the moment. <laughs> but um, mensch, I have it spelled here with a C. Uh, oh yeah, it is there too. So a mensch is a person, but more than that, it's a person who is caring and honest. It's a good person. You're a mensch. is a really nice thing to say about people. Mishigas. And Mishigas is just craziness or insanity. Kind of Mishigas. They say that um, for uh, a couple who are getting married to really get along, uh, one's Mishigas has to match the other's Mishigas. Uh, because if you've got different Mishigas, then you've got a problem. Um, a Mishuga is a crazy person. Uh, I don't want to mention any world leaders, but Meshuggah <laughs> is a crazy person. Um, your mishpacha is your family. Uh, a nash is a snack, the eating. Let's go have a nash. Uh, those guys, by the way, the Yid Life Crisis guys, they're noshing all the time in every show. They're eating, in fact, they go to food festivals. Chudaism, C A T W. There's a place called Hesky's that we went for chocolate babka. They feature in in the movie. It, it's it looks like it's you know sort of you want to eat the screen <laughs> when you see it. Um, it's very delicious and, and the movie if you can find it is is wonderful. Chudaism. Yeah. All right, I'm going to tell them we're giving all these plugs. Um, new so well. Um, let's try to at least get through this uh, list. What time is it? Oh, 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 oh. okay. Um, oy vey, you all heard it. It means kind of woe is me. Oy vey, or vey is me. Um, and this can be an exclamation of dismay, of grief, exasperation. Oy vey is me means literally, oh, woe is me. And oy gewalt is similar. Um, but oigaval also somehow implies um, fear or shock or amazement. Uh, oh my God, I'm going to plot. Uh, I'm going to fall. I'm, I'm going to explode. I'm going to plot. You got into your college. I'm going to plot. Um, okay, so one more. Schwitz, you know what that means? Sweat. Okay, your punim is your face. I can do it. I can do it. Um, <laughs> shalom, goodbye. Schlep is one of my favorite words of all the languages I speak, which is four, sort of. Um, 
you schlep your luggage, you schlep your kids, you schlep your groceries. Uh, aren't you like always schlepping? Yeah, um, it's a great word, and I, I, there's no real translation for it because it's not really carry or drag. It's yeah. No, you're schlep. <laughs> you schlep, you schlep your luggage. You don't schlep, you schlep. Okay. Yes. Although, yeah. Like you're carrying the weight of all the problems along with like yeah. physical and metaphorical. Yeah, exactly. Dragging, carrying. A shlemiel is a clumsy, inept person, a bit like a klutz. Um, schlock is just cheap stuff. Um, and stuff can be schlocky. You know, they have these 99 cent stores. I mean, what do you expect? It's going to be schlock, right? Um, a schlamaz, but we have a lot of words, <laughs> ways to call people names. And <laughs> schlamiel, a schlamazel. Schlamazel is kind of a loser. It's somebody with bad luck. Um, when a <laughs> when a shlemiel spills his matzo ball soup, he probably spills it on the shlemiel. <laughs> okay, schmaltz. I told you schmooze, chat, make small talk. Um, schmuck, bad word, uh, means a contemptible person. I'll go over that quickly. Um, a spiel uh, means. Uh, a play, spiel in, is, a, is play or toy, but it's often a long explanation. So, uh, you know, he gave a whole spiel about his plane trip. A shiksa is a non-Jewish female. Shegetz, non-Jewish male. Schmutz is dirt. So this place is schmutzy. It isn't really, but... Um, uh, shtick is your thing. What's your shtick? Um, it's something you're known for, can be a, a gimmick. Um, a shmata, my second favorite word, and one that anybody who knows me, right, Tanya, knows. A, sh a shmata literally is a cloth or a rag. So hand me that shmata so I can erase the board. But uh, because shmata means a cloth, the garment industry in New York, bless you, Guzon uh, Tairani, is um, called uh, the schmata business, the garment trade, uh, because there were so many Jews uh, involved in the garment trade. A tchotchke is a knick-knack. It's all that stuff you have at home on the mantle and on the shelves. Um, and Soros is trouble, oi, he has surus. Tuchis is your bottom. Uh, tushy, even better word. When uh, my kids, uh, my grandchildren say words like but, I don't say that. Say tush. Tush is a cute word. <laughs> a yenta, a female, busybody, and that brings us back to Fiddler on the Roof. The end, not the end. Not yet, don't clap yet. And I have one other quotation by him I wanted to read. If I can find it. Nobody move. I've got it. I got it. I be singer, in addition to saying Yiddish has not said its last word, he also said, the Yiddish language has been dying for a thousand years, and I'm sure it will go on dying for at least a thousand more. <laughs> now I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Um, so I, I love the I agree 100% about the non-Jewish language part, but 
I found it a little bit ironic because it sounds like in your own family, it has, in fact, that there's no one who speaks Yiddish anymore. Is that true? Uh, no, I, I'm going to learn it. Oh, you're I'm learning learn it. it. Yes, okay, I've started. It. Okay, um, I, I I, I'll show you my notes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my question yeah. I just I'm one of the young people that finds it cool <laughs> great, See? great. I, uh, my question was really like how you think that this happened that the language didn't get transmitted for instance in your family or in other oh, families assimilation. and you think that's the same with Yiddish as with other languages that are spoken by immigrants or do you think there's something different uh, to the Yiddish case I, it, that's a very good question I think in the case of Yiddish uh, there is culture, and uh, which all of the things I talked about, the studies and so on. So, uh, but that that is a very good question, yeah. Which I'm not sure I have an answer to. Does anybody want to respond to that? Yes. I'm not Jewish myself, but I have many Jewish friends, and uh, actually. I think it's because, well, my Jewish friends are uh, Russian, and uh, the grandpa <laughs> of my friend, sh he told me that actually it w he was ashamed, his family was ashamed to say that they were Jews, because they would get persecuted. Mm -hmm. So if you spoke, uh, well, obviously they didn't Because speak, of uh, the stigma. Yeah. yeah, the stigma. So uh, maybe it's that, maybe the, uh, since Yiddish is, means, <laughs> means, it means I, I, I'm not sure because I know many uh, Spanish and Chinese families mm -hmm. where the kids didn't learn. The parents speak it and that the kids didn't uh, because uh, in certainly in the United States and I think here in Canada, uh, all uh, cultures are all, uh, you know, seem to be assimilated. Yeah. Yes. She, he's bringing you the microphone. Or deodorant. I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is, can a Hebrew speaker understand a Yiddish speaker and vice versa? Uh, that's a good question, too. I know. <laughs> I'm a Hebrew speaker, a native, so no. No. I think... Absolutely zero. I mean, except some of the words I can see the origin sure. came from Hebrew, but maybe... And I fine. think also German uh, speakers yeah. and Yiddish speakers speakers can uh, yeah, yeah, understand. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we were having fun. <laughs>